So this was say uh, the last slide I show you. I, I have some more to uh, uh, explain uh, how to uh, uh, quantize. I mean, and I know that to do that. I mean, of course, uh, I, it is of course possible to just quantize from this. But uh, you know, if you want to understand what is happening, especially from this vacuum fluctuations, it's. Uh, uh, as I briefly told you that uh, it's better to go to uh, some gauge where you know you see the fluctuations in the matter field better and this is the so-called this a uh, flat slicing uh, where you are uh, 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 your, your spatial curvature perturbation is put to zero so uh, so this means that all these sort of scalar type fluctuations will be expressed in terms of a matter variable now, uh, this can be very easily uh, uh, obtained because uh, now we, we do have this uh, uh, gauge invariant combination. And, and then, uh, yeah, actually, there was this uh, question about how to uh, fix the coefficient. And, and depending on the, uh, uh, of, uh, how you choose this coefficient, actually, this can, you can immediately change to some other gauge. And for example, in this case, if you get rid of this factor, h over phi dot, uh, then the, the sky or delta phi will be kind of the important becomes variable. So, so and, and just changing the sign, then you have this sky minus phi dot over h r. And this is, of course, case invariant because uh, uh, this h, phi dot h over h is just a back, back, background uh, quantity. So this, as you can see, then, then if you put R equals zero. This agrees. This gauge uh, combination agrees with the delta phi. So, which actually means that this variable is the uh, fluctuation of the scalar field on flat slicing. So, and, and as we know that this is actually given in terms of this curvature perturbation on uh, commoving slice, where delta phi equals zero. So, you have this interesting relation that the. Uh, uh, the a, a fluctuation in scalar field on flat slicing is equal to minus phi dot over h times the curvature perturbation on commuting slice. So, so this also uh, actually also tells you that these two are essentially the same variable, but uh, different interpretation because uh, it has different physical or geometrical meaning. Now, so it's, it's, this is just a contact transformation. It's very easy to do a uh, transformation of the uh, Lagrangian. And uh, what you obtain is this. Now you can see that uh, in this case, well, uh, this, scale, this just appears scalar factor. So it's just the, uh, as if uh, you have uh, some uh, a scalar field on, on the given uh, expanding background with this effective mass, which is, if it is not just uh, if it is a constant, it's just you know really a mass of some scalar field. But in our case, uh, actually you have this sort of mass if standard effective mass down second derivative is the potential plus correction, and this correction actually is the correction due to this uh, gravitational coupling, as you can see this uh, if M Planck mass square in in front in, in one over Planck square. So so actually this suggests that. Uh, in some cases, you can actually ignore this. And actually, you can ignore this part as well in the uh, standard slow roll inflation. And this is the point is that a, a, we know second derivative is much smaller than Hubble square. This is the condition for this eta v uh, a, is much smaller than 1. And also, the second term, uh, which can be written approximately in terms of the expansion uh, 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 time derivative of the expansion uh, uh, parameter. So this, the, uh, during inflation, this is assumed to be much smaller than h square. This is just uh, epsilon. Huh? So, uh, so th these two conditions essentially are uh, uh, equivalent to the, those uh, slow roll conditions. And if those slow roll conditions are satisfied, actually these are always much smaller than Hubble square. And if they are always more than Hubble square, effective mass of Hubble square, then if you go deep inside the horizon, then uh, essentially you can ignore the mass term completely. Because uh, a Hubble scale is the, uh, the uh, most important scale 
uh, for, for those fields uh, or, uh, or the causality uh, which determines the causality and if mass is smaller than Hubble which means the Compton wavelength is larger than the horizon scale as so, uh, so Hubble horizon scale and uh, which essentially means that uh, you, you see this field as a massless field if you are causally detecting those fields anyway so <coughs> And, and that, that output key means actually if you go inside the horizon and do some computations uh, as long as you, you, you assume the, your, your scale of interest is inside the horizon, the horizon then this, this approximation will be a good approximation because uh, the time scale which you need is essentially a few n number of uh, e-folds, a few expansion time and during that expansion time uh, essentially this matter sort of a, you have a sufficiently large number of uh, oscillations which uh, uh, wh whose frequency will be much higher so uh, so you know a background if even if you, you can uh, take into account a, a variation wage but it's, it's, it's so called this adiabatic approximation huh? you can just just assume it as a constant and in the end if you want this to vary in time, you can just let it vary in time. Okay, so and, and this is the uh, standard procedure you do in uh, uh, quantum field theory on curved background. And, and I, mean, I mean, it doesn't have to be curved background, but anyway. So you, you do have the uh, define a uh, canonical conjugate variable, and, and the, uh, you uh, a assume this canonical commutation relation. And, and, and then you expand this in terms of mode functions uh, with and, uh, the coefficient given by the annihilation and creation operators. And uh, then this uh, mode function, uh, uh, well, so now I'm just using this exponential kx to expand each modes, Fourier modes. Then, then uh, this time dependent function, which we call mode function, satisfies the equation, standard equation, scalar field equation with uh, Laplacian replaced by k square, and an important thing is that the, if you want to satisfy this canonical quantization condition, then and if you assume the standard sort of AA dagger commutation relation, then these a solution of this must satisfy this uh, condition chi chi bar. This is the uh, complex conjugate prime minus chi prime chi bar must be equal to one over a square. This is so-called uh, Klein-Gordon normalization. So uh, this is, you, you have Klein-Gordon sort of inner product, which is not really the standard inner product. It can take negative values, positive values. And this is uh, the case of the famous sort of a second, second quantization, you say. That when you do the quantization field, then you have a, a you don't, uh, uh, this, uh, how to say? <laughs> yeah, wave function can have some negative in the value, uh, negative index value. Anyway, the whole point is that this doesn't, it, it's because of this minus sign, as you see, I, I, so uh, the sign, uh, the, uh, it doesn't fix the, um, this mode function completely. And usually you have to uh, appeal to some kind of symmetry argument. And in, in the, if uh, this uh, is completely, it lives in the flat space, uh, and uh, if, for example, so uh, so this h is zero and, and a is constant and so on and so forth. Uh, in that case, we know in, in the flat space uh, the, uh, the vacuum. Uh, maybe this is from uh, from some experience, but in that case, uh, the vacuum should satisfy so-called Poincaré invariance. So uh, if you uh, assume this Poincaré invariance, then you immediately get the, uh, the uh, solution for chi. So you generally, of course, you have two independent solutions, but you select a single mode, and which is called the positive frequency function. And positive frequency mean, means that the, uh, if you go to, uh, say, high frequency, let's say, uh, then uh, this time derivative of chi would be proportional to the energy. So, uh, so if you Right, like in, in, in the 
is it the, you, you, yeah, yeah, you have E, so you, you, with, so if, uh, if uh, this mode function satisfies this kind of Schrodinger type equation with a positive uh, uh, energy condition, then this, this mode function is called positive uh, uh, frequency function. But, but this, is, this can be defined only in a very high frequency or uh, uh, when you have some symmetries, like a Poincaré symmetry or time, time, time translation symmetry. Fortunately, in our case, if you go back in time, then you have a frequency becomes smaller and frequency, no, a wavelength becomes smaller and smaller, and, and, and it becomes a microscopic size. And in, uh, in that limit, you can actually ignore the expansion of the universe. Therefore, in that limit, you can uh, clearly have a, have a well-defined positive frequency function and uh, which is essentially this exponential ik eta. Now, so this eta behaves like standard time. Now, then, then uh, in, in this limit, if you, and if you ignore this m square, because it's always small, much smaller than h square, and h square is smaller than k over h square, so, so you can just assume massless equations, and then, then this, is, this will be the exact solution if uh, this is purely massless. And this massless, Approximation is fine as long as your scale is, well, it can be slightly uh, above the sort of Hubble horizon scale, but be well below the mass scale. And, and uh, so, so uh, and, and, and then you can easily see if you take a very high frequency limit, which means that you go back in time. Oh, by the way, maybe I, I should have uh, said somewhere that the, uh, you know, maybe previous year. Yeah, so if you uh, write the just, uh, universe uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, the uh, scale factor in terms of conformal time, then you have this 1 over minus h eta. The, the, the eta uh, this is not this uh, parameter eta. It's, it's the, now maybe people mostly use tau, but I sort of use, usually use tau for real proper time. So, so I, here I, I use eta, but in any case, this it ranges from minus infinity to zero. As I told you that in a, a exponential expanding universe, uh, or the accelerating universe, you have, uh, if this continues forever, then eta is unbounded below, but will be bounded above. <laughs> okay, yes. But anyway, so, so and, and you can just, uh, uh, above bound to be uh, zero. But anyway, so this is the uh, standard sort of a way of write down the scale factor in the star space. And, and in, the, in this uh, the star approximation, you get this uh, uh, mod function. And if you go into the very high frequency, meaning that the, the uh, wavelength is much smaller than the Hubble scale, then you have the standard sort of a, a, a positive frequency mod function. You, Obtain in, in flat space, except for this scale factor A, which just uh, a, a gives you this normalization. Yes, uh, and and uh, if you go to on the other hand to a low, a small lower frequency or late time where eta goes to zero, you cannot use the limit because, as I said, I, I'm using this Doshita approximation, which is valid only essentially within the horizon, Hubble horizon scale. So uh, beyond the horizon scale, this is not so accurate. But in any case, well, as soon as this becomes smaller than one, and, and, and which it eats, so k eta, when eta goes to zero, that's the future infinity. So, uh, uh, and, and uh, when this k eta is, well, okay, eta is negative, so it's minus one, that, that corresponds to the Hubble horizon crossing because, uh, Like this. Scale factor, as I said, is given like this. Then a prime over a is minus one over eta, right? I mean, uh, this this is just h uh, square eta square. H eta square. So, so, so this this is I call the uh, Hubble parameter in conformal time. And if k is much greater than 
this, then this is well inside the horizon, and the horizon uh, condition, uh, the horizon crossing, we say, uh, it occurs in this. So this means k eta is minus one. So this is the moment where the uh, the uh, mode goes out of the horizon, and uh, <coughs> as soon as it goes out of the horizon, because uh, eta goes to zero very rapidly, so it sort of freezes out. It becomes uh, some uh, constant. Yes, and, and this this uh, the fact that it, this mode function becomes constant is constant to be uh, as the uh, the modes become classical, because uh, uh, if you take this limit then it will no longer satisfy all these uh, commutation relations. And so, uh, so it is, a, I mean, it is an approximation, but uh, it, 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 this approximation uh, is uh, considered to be, uh, right, it is equivalent to the fact that the, all these modes become sort of classical. And probably this is a, a I mean, it, you know, you may need some more deep sort of reasoning, but in any case, physically this is very reasonable because uh, if a uh, scale is much greater than horizon, and if you are observer, which can observe only something which occurs within Hubble horizon scale, uh, Hubble, t Hubble time scale, then these modes do not oscillate or anything, but uh, you have some uh, amplitude fluctuation there. <laughs> so, so this for us. This would uh, look like a background. There's some quantity on your universe background. So, 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 uh, unless you think that the universe is, in, you know, fluctuating, uh, if you observe this, then they, this this would look exactly like a classical random variable. Anyway, so, so this is what happens, and on on, on about approximately on the horizon crossing, or a little bit after horizon crossing, you can just compute the fluctuation amplitude and, and then or the, uh, it, and so it's the uh, mode function square uh, times the uh, essentially the uh, uh, phase volume and so that uh, this totally this has the same dimension as the scalar field dimension or meaning the mass square then you can easily if you just compute plug this in you get this h over 2 pi square and in, in the fact the reason why this becomes independent is because of this extra k square factor coming in from uh, when so so when this is large, this kills one of the k and and it, it gave the standard one over square root k uh, normalization. But uh, when this goes to zero, this appears and and which gives you a very very a dense how to say high actually logarithmically divergent. Uh, a, uh, a uh, condensation uh, on very low k mode, and so the, the important point is anyway. So for each mode k, independent, independ essentially almost independent of k. If you can assume h to be almost constant, then you have a so-called scale invariant spectrum of the uh, scalar perturbation, uh, scalar field perturbation on flat slicing. Okay, but as I said, this this is a uh, good approximation only for uh, inside the horizon, and and you have to actually know the evolution of this outside the horizon, and and you could of course if you know all these details of this um, effect and so on, you can of course solve these equations, but uh, it's much easier to actually appeal to our knowledge that we have just shown, uh, you know. This morning, that the uh, this curvature perturbation in convolving slice actually becomes a constant, and and it becomes a, uh, this constant mode becomes dominating in in the standard single field solar inflation. So we know that, uh, and we ha we have this relation between these two. So it just takes some time, slightly beyond the horizon crossing time, uh, and and and, yeah, and then beyond that, this curvature perturbation will be just a constant. So this eta, even though eta goes to almost zero, but this value is the same as the value at horizon crossing. And this horizon crossing value can be evaluated by horizon crossing value of the scalar field fluctuations in flat slice flashing. And which is this result, which is the uh, sort of a standard result for 
the amplitude of the curvature perturbation, and this remains constant in time as long as the scale is as as so this is the uh, a, a, a some sort of a space no no time space diagram which I quite often uh, draw so uh, this uh, time is in terms of log log of uh, scale factor which is mean, essentially means number of e force this is the log of uh, actual physical wavelengths then uh, for example during inflation the horizon scale uh, H inverse, oops, so something wrong with it. Uh, something wrong, or well, maybe it's just uh, too thin. But anyway, uh, so, so this will be the Hubble scale, uh, 1 over H, and after inflation, essentially, it starts to grow faster than the expansion of the universe. And this green line corresponds to the so called co moving scale, where the you just move with the expansion. Uh, so if you fix K, then this is, oh, by the way, yes. So this is co-moving wave number. And then for a given co-moving wave number, if you go back in time, it is deep inside the horizon. That's why you can uh, ignore the expansion of the universe and everything. And you can uh, define a well-defined vacuum here. And then you evolve it and, and evolves outside. And you have some non-trivial evolutions. If you, if, you, if you want to evolve the skull field, but if you switch to this uh, curvature perturbation, then, then we know since this remains constant, you don't really have to solve anything. You just uh, a, a assume this is a constant. And the constant value is just given by this value at the horizon crossing, and which uh, remains constant until it re enters the horizon. So the other case, what? Sorry? If K changes, then it goes something like this. Yes. So for large case this side, small case this side. Yeah. Yes. So actually, the form of the chi is uh, assumed to be a given side of horizon. Yeah, yeah. But uh, as I said, uh, actually, uh, uh, if the mass is much smaller than Hubble and uh, uh, Hubble parameter variation is small enough, which means this epsilon is small enough. So in, in, at the leading order approximation, you can assume this be slow, slowly depending on time. It's the sort of idea of the approximation. And also, this approximation uh, to take a slightly outside the horizon, which means that this is small, like uh, maybe 0.01 or 001, which, you know, just a few number of e-folds, uh, this will become very small. This k, k eta, well, Actually, uh, so, so uh, well, as you can see from here, k over a uh, is a, a, a k minus k eta. And, and if you divide by h, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I've written something here, but in, in the real, so, sort of, a, sort of, a, how to say, proper time, proper Hubble parameter and the proper wave, wave number. So this is the equality. And if you just go outside the horizon, and if you wait for, say, two or three number of e-folds, this will decrease by a huge, num huge amount. So just a few number of e-folds, this becomes totally negligible. Okay. Yes. So, and, so uh, but uh, still, if you assume this is much smaller than h square, then uh, this approximation is still OK. So, so this is how you do it. Uh, that's why you have this, you know, value. It must be evaluated at horizon crossing or slightly after or before. But again, if uh, this parameter varies very slowly in time, then it doesn't really matter uh, as long as you have uh, some fixed sort of a way to a uh, uh, point to evaluate. Yes. I mean, maybe exactly at the horizon cross, and maybe slightly after or slightly before, it doesn't really matter. Yes. But anyway, so this is how you obtain the amplitude. Now, of course, this was a, a, a more, I, I, what I said was a uh, sort of physically clear. And actually, if you have multi field, uh, I, I strongly recommend you to use this because in this case flat slicing is very well defined and, and for each flat slice for, for given flat slicing condition 
you have several, if you have several scalar fields, you can just compute all several scalar fields, their fluctuations like this. And, and, and of course, the relation from that fluctuation amplitude to, uh, the, uh, to uh, this curvature perturbation becomes highly non-trivial. And, and, and this is where soon, later, within 10 minutes, I hope, I will start talking about delta n. But uh, so this delta n formalism becomes useful. But for the moment, uh, I, I, for, for single field, it doesn't really matter. And in, in this case, actually, you can just directly a, uh, a quantize this uh, curvature perturbation from the beginning and in the standard way. Although, it, since this, this variable is not so, how to say, physically, it, 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 the meaning of this variable is not so clear when, when you go deep inside the horizon. So you don't really have any uh, physical intuition. But anyway, uh, you know, mathematically, you can always do the same thing and you get the, essentially the same result. Okay. Now, I think uh, yeah, well, this is just a beginning of so-called delta n formalism. Now, if you take a look at this equation, and, and if you recall that number we fold is just dn is hdt, but uh, since we are counting the uh, number we folds from some, some past time to some fixed future point, the, if you take the derivative, you get minus sign because uh, it's not the, you know you're going forward, but the, the number we for you counting is going backward in time. But but uh, it doesn't really matter in any case. Anyway, this means that if you take the derivative of n in terms of phi, then you get f f h over uh, h over phi dot. Now, so so you can rewrite this equation like d n d phi times h over 2 pi. And, and uh, as we have just seen, this h over 2 pi actually corresponds to fluctuations in flat slicing. So you can replace this h over 2 pi as some representative uh, fluctuation amplitude of delta phi. Then if you look at this, and if you take the square root, then you find the curvature perturbation uh, is actually a fluctuations in number of evil evaluate at horizon crossing, assuming you have some fluctuation in the value of the scalar field. And this, this delta phi should be evaluated on flat slice. So the, it is, this flat slide condition is very important, but uh, given this condition, and if you evaluate on this slice the fluctuations in the scalar field of the background, so, and, and if you know the background evolutions, then uh, you immediately obtain the amplitude of coverage perturbation. This is sort of an essence of the delta n, which was first uh, found by uh, Stravinsky, and, and they, now it can be applied to any multiple scalar fields and so on and so forth. Okay, so, uh, so this is sort of a basic a formulation of uh, linear perturbations. Now I'd like to go into delta n. Any questions so far? It's okay? Okay. Yes. Now, wait a minute. Oh, no, no. Yes. So this, I'm just combining several different slides so that font becomes different. <laughs> don't, don't worry. Now, let, let me just go into delta n formalism. And uh, this is the uh, sort of uh, references. Oh, by the way, so if you want, to, I can just give you the uh, slides later, so uh, you don't have to take uh, notes of this. But anyway, some uh, a papers, which, uh, as you could see, uh, mainly uh, written by myself or my collaborators, and uh, so it's highly biased, but uh, hopefully uh, they are useful enough. And and one more thing, just a couple one month or two months ago, we have finally finished publishing this book from the World Scientific. And uh, so uh, this is the state of informalism in cosmological perturbation theory. So, so if you 
Uh, I'm happy to buy them, please. <laughs> Actually, if you don't have to, if you go into, uh, I think it's archive, huh? Some, and you look for this, uh, these names, yeah, and, and or maybe this title. Uh, uh, there is a archive version, which uh, is essentially the same. Maybe there are small uh, typos and something which uh, we didn't correct. But uh, so, so, but but yes, uh, if you buy them, then uh, I get some money. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what is delta n? Uh, first of all, so uh, this is just I'm, I'm start from definition and then I. Then I will uh, tell you how, why it is so useful, although there's one person here who don't think it is useful. <laughs> anyway, so, so let me just uh, start with the definition. So delta n is simply the perturbation in number of e-folds counted backward in time from some fixed final time. And this final time, if you know that it, it, it should, if you can take this to be some time in the radiation dominant universe, that would be the best. Uh, uh, but uh, assuming that you know the evolutions, say from the end of inflation to this sometime later uh, in the radiation dominance, then you, you can just replace that time by the end of inflation. But anyway, so this automatically means it is non local in time by definition. Yes, it's, it's the uh, kind of integral, yes, of uh, fr uh, between. At the uh, from from some time to until the end of time. So and uh, delta oh yeah yes so f should be chosen such that the evolution of the universe has become unique, and and this we call adiabatic and um, adiabatic limit. It's it's a sort of different way of terminology, I guess. Uh, the the whole point is that uh, when you consider in this limit, then the contents of the say matter contents of the universe is unique. For example, uh, in our universe, we have uh, cold dark matter, baryons, and so on. And, and uh, uh, we, we think that the baryon to photon ratio is a constant. If this varies in, t in space, then you have a different, sort of a different universe in different parts of the space. But if you assume this is unique, uniquely determined, and then, then you have a, a uh, so, so called no, no isocurvature mode or you know, no additional degrees of freedom. Uh, and in this case, uh, universe evolution will be completely uh, unique. You know, if you give the temperature, then you know the time and expansion rate and everything. So, so this is what we call adiabatic limit. Okay? So, uh, uh, so, so if you have some so called isocurvature perturbation, which means that isocurvature means that it's, it doesn't contribute to coverage. Oh, so, so the important point, of course, this is the general relativity. And general relativity, the source term is always T mu nu, as you all know. Yes, so, so it's G mu nu, eight by G, T mu nu. And, and uh, this is a total energy moment of tensor of matter. And, and uh, you know, gravity doesn't care what kind of uh, energy momentum tensor you have, whether it's black, white, uh, green, or you know, different, whether it's coke A, coke B, it doesn't matter. Total energy momentum tensor is the most important. So if you have some variations in the matter contents, this is isocurvature, it, as long as it, it doesn't affect the total energy momentum tensor. And there are lots of isocurvature perturbations. Uh, for example, you know, right now I have this, uh, uh, what do you call this color, a wine color shirt, and I can change into a white color shirt. And they probably have the same weight, but the color is different. This is isocurvature perturbation. Okay? So, so, but uh, if you have those isocurvature perturbation which persist until today, then you have to do something different. So we just assume that such perturbation doesn't exist. Especially on, on those large cosmological scales. On this present day scale, yes, as I said, we have a lot of isocurvature perturbations. But uh, yeah, I, I, you know, we are talking about cosmology. So, and, and, and uh, a, actually, a, a, oh, oh, this is, yeah, I, I will come back to later. Actually, there is some nonlinear a, a, uh, extension of this delta n. And, and uh, uh, of this so-called co-moving curvature perturbation, and 
and, and uh, uh, we can easily, well, from this definition, uh, uh, how say, uh, get this equality that this is equal to the curvature perturbation uh, you want to obtain on some later time. So this is this will give you the initial condition for our universe, for CMB or large scale structure and so on and so forth. And uh, and, and the important point is that this is in, in, uh, essentially uh, independent of theory of gravity. As long as the uh, theory of gravity is described in terms of metric and our universe is expanding, if it is contracting, there are small problems sometimes, but uh, even in a contracting universe, by the way, uh, if you are careful enough, you can actually use this. Anyway, so essentially then there are essentially three types of delta n. Uh, let's say this is the final time uh, where you observe the curvature perturbation and beyond which actually uh, th those curvature perturbations will be constant even in, at the nonlinear level and this is the uh, sort of a conserv conservation we have just seen in the linear case but you can extend this linear case to nonlinear case but anyway the point is that so if you have say single field let's say or you have, let's say you have some two fields huh? but if I1 is completely isocurvature or it just doesn't exist in our universe, then fluctuations of the number of, this is the, let's say the length of this line corresponds to the say, number of E-fold, let's say. Then fluctuation number of E-fold means fluctuations along this direction, or this is equivalent to this, the, this fluctuation, this scale field in the, uh, some uh, flat slicing. Now, you may have some uh, non-trivial trajectories which uh, depart from each other uh, and uh, converge to one. In such a case, of course, depending on which route you come from, maybe the number of people is different. So, so, so in this case, uh, it is very important to uh, take into account the fluctuations of both fields. And although, for example, in the beginning you see, you think that the uh, the fluctuation in this 5-1 direction is completely isocurvature, it might contribute substantially at the end. Yes. So, so uh, uh, the notion of isocurvature or not is actually determined, defined only at the end. It's useless to talk about adiabatic perturbation, isocurvature perturbation along each trajectory. Because <laughs> Uh, you know, there are many people, of course, who want to compute in this way, and it's okay, but uh, then, then so you sort of uh, compute something useless, and, and, and the, you, the answer you get only at the end has some meaning. And, and so during, inflation, during the evolution, you may have some funny behavior of those, say, uh, uh, coverage perturbation or delta phi or so on, but those doesn't mean much. It, it, you know, the only thing which is meaningful is the difference from here to here. And, and, and uh, similar to this, you can have a, a uh, sort of a, a really a completely isocurvature perturbation in the beginning, so that the trajectory is all uh, parallel to this phi 2 axis, and, and, uh, so, and there's no difference between these two universes until some moment where you have some kind of transition. And, and when you have this transition, and depending on how transition occurs, maybe this gives you more number of people than this gives you less number of people. And in this case, because of the difference in the uh, value of 5n, you have a, a coverage of perturbation at the end. And, and a, a, the one typical example is so-called the Carverton model. The Carverton is essentially purely as a curvature during inflation. But uh, after inflation, it starts to dominate, and, and when they decay, they determine the final amplitude of curvature perturbation. So, so in this case, seemingly as a curvature becomes real adiabatic perturbation in the end. So, so, so as you see, in any case, uh, you shouldn't actually uh, how to say, classify things into adiabatic and uh, you can, but it, it is meaningless to classify the uh, fluctuations during inflation uh, into adiabatic and isocurvature because uh, what is important is only the end. 
uh, end value, and which it may dom be dominated by one of those modes or uh, combination, or you know, there, there can be many th variations. Okay. Is, is this figure sort of clear? I mean, uh, if uh, this is sort of important, you know, you all, always have to imagine this figure when you compute the term. Is <laughs> okay? Yeah, all right. I, oh, we can come back later. Yes. yes. So, in the second case, hmm. um, you actually um, meant um, those two lines can hmm. be very complicated. Yeah. At the end. Yeah, yeah. The right. Yes. Uh, I mean, the, the simplest actually is the case of two field models when you have this. Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe you know the uh, the what do you call this. Uh, you know, <laughs> some, some, uh, it's, it's like a hilltop case. I mean, you have two hills, okay. And, and, and trajectory, for example, this trajectory, if it is exactly on top, then it just goes to this point. And, and it, but otherwise, you go this direction and this direction, something like this. And in this case, uh, all the uh, trajectory converges to uh, some single point if you have the sort of valley here. And about that, you know, they, they go away from this sort of hilltop place. And, and then, uh, so in the beginning, it looks like this uh, isocurvature perturbation, but actually this end up with a different, so for example, this has n1 equals 100 or 10, and the next one is n is 12, and so on and so forth. Or maybe the other way around, yes, probably yes. Because uh, usually it goes closer to closer to this, uh, Hilltop, it takes more and more time. Huh? So, 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 such cases, yeah. This the second one. Yes. Any other? Is okay? Okay. So, now, now let uh, me start from uh, linear perturbation theory, uh, which is, is more uh, easy to see. So, we have, uh, as before, some. Uh, s a this lapse function perturbation uh, uh, for the simplicity because the, the argument doesn't depend on the uh, choice of spatial coordinates so I, I just put this b equal to zero shift fu shift function equal to zero and you write down the uh, uh, curvature perturbation which is essentially longitudinal mode and the traceless part uh, actually there's a small error that actually this includes this Laplacian e <laughs> and there's something wrong with when I well, original, as you can see, original one is the PowerPoint, and when I made a, <laughs> a PDF file, something went wrong. Uh, the, well, you know, uh, this is nothing to the physics, but uh, so I, when you use PowerPoint in sort of, a, how to say, this Microsoft, uh, uh, what do you call this, Windows, and, and uh, if you transfer that into a the PowerPoint in Macintosh, everything becomes uh, weird. Huh? So when I have to do this, I always make a, pa a PDF file first and transfer. But sometimes even PDF file can get screwed up. But anyway, maybe somebody knows better way to do this. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, just use Mac. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But some people have some PowerPoints, for example, and I'm, I'm lazy enough not to you know, right from scratch. I always ask my students to uh, give me the file first and just, you know, <laughs> modify things. And, and quite often they give me the PowerPoint file. So how can I do? <laughs> sorry, nothing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, so, so, sorry, so, so, actually, yeah, this term is absent in this definition, as I have shown in the case of uh, the uh, 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 quantizations. Huh? So, uh, sorry about this, so it's not really traceless. But the uh, tensor part is traceless and transverse. So, and, and, uh, but uh, here, well, uh, this doesn't play much role because, uh, uh, not because, I mean, it, it just, uh, uh, on superhorizon scale, again, it, it just stays almost constant. And, and uh, so, in some sense, you can absorb that into a gauge transformation. Anyway, 
a, a, so as you can see, this, this, uh, if you consider two uh, a, a time slices, one at the t and one at t plus dt, then this is just uh, uh, this. Now I'm using proper time as tau. D tau is one plus a dt. This is the definition of the uh, lapse function, by the way. So this determines the, the, the relation between the uh, coordinate time to the proper time. Yes. And as I said, the curvature evaluation on this uh, hypersurface is given by this. So this R it just behaves like uh, a, uh, a potential. Right? And, and, and another important thing is that if you uh, compute the uh, fluctuation expansion rate, then you have the background expansion times 1 minus a plus total time derivative. This is the most important point. And actually, this is nothing to do, as you can see, nothing to do with the uh, theory of gravity. It's just a, ex a, a expansion, how to say, a, a uh, expression of geometrical quantity. Yes? So the uh, only thing you need is the uh, uh, presence of uh, hypersurface presence of a covariant four-dimensional metric. And, and this automatically follows, okay? Now, we have many choices. I, I, I just talked about this commoving slice, and, and they actually this corresponds to so-called uh, velocity orthogonal slicing in, from the, a, 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 what do you call, the uh, relativistic point of view, but it doesn't so matter at the moment so much. Anyway, so this is what we used to use to compute the curvature perturbation. And, and uh, uniform density slice, which is quite close to this, is defined in terms of density. So you can just define the uh, fluctuation, uh, a, 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 the slicing where the fluctuation vanishes, <laughs> fluctuation density vanishes. And, uh, and these are uh, closely related, but this case, can, as I said, the, the commented, you may not be able to choose this once you try to go to nonlinear level. This definition may not apply because uh, this is not, uh, uh, how to say, the coordinate which you can always choose. Sometimes there's no, no way to choose this. But this is a just sort of a scalar uh, condition, so it's very easy to choose. Uh, so uh, uh, sometimes instead of convolving slicing, if you go to nonlinear level, it's better to choose uniform density slice. And uh, their differences are minimal, very small. Anyway, and, 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 and by the way, so this is kind of matter-based uh, gauges. And another is the, as I once I discussed, this flat slicing, where you put the curvature equal to zero. And, and there's uh, something very close to this is called uniform Hubble slicing. Actually, this slicing condition is slightly complicated, but uh, geometrically has, uh, has a very good uh, features. And, and uh, actually, if you know the, uh, the numerical relativity computed in uh, those you know, black hole collisions and so on, so they essentially use so-called maximal slicing, where this is exactly zero. Yes. Of course, in the universe, expanding universe, if you put this equal to zero, your, your coordinate system soon becomes singular. So that would not be good. But instead, you can choose expansion to be uniform in space. Yes, non-vanishing, but uniform in space. And, and uh, this uh, is almost equal to this plus, uh, as you could sort of imagine now. Uh, I mean, without having any fluctuations in curvature, is close to uniformly expanding universe. Uh, so. Anyway, so, so this uh, geometrically based, uh, fairly well used uh, coordinate uh, conditions. Another thing which we are quite familiar with, the so-called shear free or Newton gauge or longitudinal gauge, you know, many, th and in, in which you just assume this DIDJ, you know, component to be zero. So, uh, some, uh, something wrong, but anyway, so, <laughs> a, a, so, so, so in, in uh, a Fourier component, of, of course, I mean, uh, a time derivative equal to zero is equal to uh, it's uh, equal to zero, and apart from just constant, constant is since it's a k equal zero mode, uh, we sort of remove this, uh, you know, the uh, k equal zero mode from discussion. So, so this means that you have no shear 
on, on the... Uh, this I'm sorry, if it's time derivative, yeah. zero, then it's arbitrary function of special coordinate. What do you mean? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, 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 you have this in front, which you... So, so, so the actual, actual, actual uh, uh, condition is ti dj e dot equals zero. This. It's okay. But the last line is Yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Forget about this. Yes, I'm, I'm wrong. Yes, you, you, you got a point. <laughs> I agree. Anyway, so, so, uh, so, uh, but uh, at, at the leading order of approximation, on, and if you talk about some large scale fluctuations, uh, this I can come back later, but this commoving gauge slicing is actually very close to uniform density slicing. And as you could imagine from the sort of a freedom equation, uniform density, if you have a uniform density, you would have the uniform Hubble expansion. So these three actually are essentially equal on very large scales, where fluctuations, spatial fluctuations are uh, very, or have large uh, wavelengths. Now, so in that limit, actually what people call separate universe approach applies, or in, uh, well, in more sort of a, I say, a, a, a sort of a right way of saying is so-called spatial gradient expansion. And uh, if you if you are a particle physicist, you you deal with all these uh, you know, uh, renormalization, all these things, and then the corrections, and you expand in terms of the derivatives. Huh? Those are gradient expansion, and in, and in this case, you know, you ignore this high frequency modes and just focus on the small low infrared limit. And, and we, this is essentially the same, except that we always focus on spatial things uh, in, in cosmology because the time direction, everything changes. Yes. So we only have the spatial direction. So, so in this approach, uh, 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 if you just write down this, this is, if, if you have pure uh, spatially uh, uh, homogeneous universe, this, this should give you the uh, Friedman equation. Uh, but instead, if you expand in uh, this uh, uh, gradient expansion with epsilon being the uh, ratio of the Hubble horizon scale to the uh, wavelengths, and which is very small on a very long wavelength modes, then you have the epsilon square term, which is essentially this uh, curvature term, and, and the higher order terms, which is epsilon to the fourth order, equals uh, density. So this will be the uh, a leading order or including epsilon square order a Friedman equation, uh, uh, sort of a space dependent Friedman equation. Now, at leading order, of course, uh, uh, as I said, I mean, if you ignore completely and take the epsilon zero limit, then this h square is equal to density. So, th so that's the reason why uniform density slice agrees with uniform Hubble slicing. So, Mr. Yes. at which point you deviate from this quasi-isotropic solution by Belinsky colliding operations? It's also gradient expansion. Right, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, uh, so, so, in some sense, they take this so-called decaying modes into account, and, and which means that even if you take epsilon zero limit, you have an isotopy, remaining an isotopy. Yes, so, so this here, in, I, I will re I try to go back in, in when I discuss the uh, nonlinear case, I, I go to this. You, you, we have a one uh, important assumption that in the limit epsilon goes to zero, your universe metric uh, essentially approaches Friedman metric. So, but they are considered more generic cases. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And, but uh, because of the inflation expansion, that's the essential sort of uh, view we have. Uh, if you have exponential expansion, and, and as we all know, it, or not really know, but we assume, and this assumption is consistent with the result, that an SLP usually decays out. So, uh, so, so you can just assume a non-decaying 
uh, only uh, uh, assume the existence of non decay modes. Yeah. But what do you mean anisotropy goes up? Gravitational wave are frozen. Frozen. Yeah, that's I right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That, but but uh, if you uh, if you consider a scales of the horizon, yes. and, and those are frozen, so they are just a constant sort of a coordinate transformation. You can just absorb everything into coordinates. Okay. Yeah, this is the equivalence principle. Yeah. Okay. So so unless I mean, if you have decaying mode and a, a time dependence is of order of Hubble, then you cannot do that. But uh, if uh, you ignore this, or if you assume this decay mode decayed out already, then the remaining constant mode is just a gauge. Right, but yeah. you, you know, that there is a big difference. You see, normally in the Friedman universe, you are getting decay mode by time shift. In the normal Friedman universe, OK, because it's just time shift, and it's Hubble constant, which is decreasing. Sorry, 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 which mode are you, you talking see, about? You are getting two modes. Mm -hmm. One mode mm -hmm. you are getting mm -hmm. by so called variation of this cosmological parameter omega mm -hmm. in this separate universe. Mm -hmm. The other mode by the shift of the in the time, you see, for the homogeneous solution. And for homogeneous solution, shift in the time in the universe, which is not accelerating, corresponds to the decay mode. But in uh, accelerated expansions, it doesn't correspond to the decay mode, you see? I'm not exactly sure. Can, can you I just wait know. until uh, I, I give the equation, then you can just uh, make a question or comments or maybe objections again? Because uh, no, I don't, I, yeah, yeah, but I don't quite understand uh, your point yet, so. No, I, yeah. it's in this Dovich book, for instance, the two modes, one is related with the time shift, and uh, the other is related with perturbation of omega in this separate universe approach. Well, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, so in that sense, omega, you mean what? The, the density? Omega is cosmological parameter density. Well, it doesn't mean much. I mean, it's just a... No, okay, we can discuss. Oh, okay. I, maybe, maybe you're talking isochromature more then. No, no, we are talking about adiabatic. Okay, uh, well, uh, well, okay. So, so as you can see, there's no adiabatic, uh, in that sense, no, no, uh, no, say, uh, in this limit, deep strong zero limit, <laughs> you, you don't have any fluctuations of omega, okay? I mean, it doesn't exist. No, you can compare, actually. Compare what? Yeah, so... Uh, no, 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 we don't compare. This, this is for non well, this is linear perturbation, but I'm taking the linear perturbation into, and we are not talking about background or anything. It's just given space. Sorry. Again, yeah. okay, <laughs> it's homogeneous. That, no, no, this is not how in homogeneous, huh? Yeah, but as you can, yeah. I mean, I, okay, so I, okay, so 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 what do you mean by the fluctuation of omega? Where where does it exist? How do you your, do that? Your equation doesn't exist because yeah. you said omega equal one. But if you would have the curvature, no. term, this is the curvature. Yeah, this is epsilon square term. Yeah, that's epsilon square. No. It's proportional to the Laplace. So what yeah, is Laplace? yeah. So Laplacian special, the Laplacian. Yes, co moving coordinates. But for homogeneous mode, what is oh, it? Yeah, yeah, well, so this just example calls it K, huh? Yeah. yeah I mean, very good. So yeah. this is right. the variation of this constant K. Yeah, 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 but it's 1 over a square. And it, it, you do have epsilon square in front, I mean, in, in this picture, and, and that's the important thing. This decays out, and at leading order, I mean, to the second order, actually, then this uh, gauge condition becomes more important, but yeah, all right. <laughs> anyway, so, so what uh, is written here is that, so at the leading order, which is so-called separate universe approach, where the, you take epsilon goes to the limit, then you have this equation, uh, and you have the fluctuation, you, have, you may have some variations in space of the row, and, but which is exactly equal to the variation in the Hubble parameter, yes. And, and in this case, when I say local, local means that they measure at the level scale of the hub, each Hubble horizon scale. Okay. Right. So now, as you could then easily see, I mean, uh, from this equation, if uh, R is time independent, then actually it's standard Friedman equation, but in, except that it is 
spatial dependent holds up through epsilon square. Yeah, we inclu even including this, you have a, a freedom equation, and, and which is quite important. So this actually means that actually, if you produce some fluctuation in uh, which uh, remains constant in time, uh, then that uh, uh, actually gives rise to non-trivial curvature. If you, if this scale, uh, I mean, uh, if if you wait enough. So that uh, this decreases like eight, one over eight to the fourth and eight cube, where this this is only a square. So the curvature start to appear, and this appearance of curvature is the source of everything. <laughs> and uh, if I have time, I will go into this uh, 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 primordial block of formation. But this primordial block of formation actually is not from the density perturbation; it's from the curvature which was negligible in the beginning, but gradually becomes important, and then make the, uh, some certain space collapse into black hole. But anyway, so you can just rewrite this in this form. So, and as I told you, that commoving curvature perturbation in adiabatic limit, where the evolution of the universe becomes unique, then it, it is conserved. Yes, and it is conserved, and, and uh, it is a and, and this conserved quantity will uh, determine this curvature of the space, yes, in the local curvature of the space. And, and, and so, uh, so this means that the, if you go into co-moving a uniform density in a bubble slice, and where then, then uh, local freedom equation holds, and uh, through order epsilon square, yeah, where you can assume this to be a constant and, and in the other limit, then actually including the coverage term, it, it, the, uh, this uh, Friedman equation holds, a spatial dependent Friedman equation. So, oops, why, why in uh, oh yeah, now, now I, I have to pro write down the delta n formalism, I mean <laughs> form. So delta n, as I said, is the uh, number of evil from certain time t to some final time. and, and uh, and, and it's just a, 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 a subtract some uh, background fiducia value. And uh, at the linear perturbation level, actually, this Hubble expansion is uh, defined with respect to the proper time. So integral is dt, d, no, instead of dt, sorry, d tau. And so which means, actually, uh, if you remember this, uh, this formula, you have a fluctuation which contains 1 minus a, but d tau contains 1 plus a. And actually, this is correct up to fully nonlinear, but at linear order, you can see that if you multiply this by this, then this part cancels at the linear level. So, so this means that if you integrate the Hubble expansion along the time, and then they compute the number of e-folds from certain time t to the final, then the, the, this integral becomes total deriv time derivative, meaning that it can be integrated out. So it is a non-local quantity, which you have to integrate from beginning to the end, but the end result depends only on initial and final. And if you ignore this order epsilon square correction at leading order, Actually, it is just given by the difference between the coverage perturbation of the final hypersurface minus coverage perturbation initial slice. So, and, and this is a very interesting equation because now we haven't so far chosen any gauge, but it, now here we choose a special gauge. We choose initial slice as flat slice. Because we know that this slice is most convenient for computing quantum vacuum fluctuation scalar field. So you choose this slice, but final slice we choose co-moving because we know on co-moving slice, coverage perturbation is conserved. So we don't have to do any uh, uh, you know, uh, evolutions from now. Okay, if you choose that, if you look at this delta n, the coverage perturbation of the final slice and initial slice, but we choose the initial final slice to be co-moving, so it's just something constant, and the initial slice to be zero. <laughs> so this disappears. 
So, so this means that delta m, yes, from some initial time slice with the flat to the final co-moving slice is equal to the coverage of evaluation you want to compute. So this is the delta m formula. Okay, so the only thing now is remaining is how to compute delta n, but uh, yes, uh, which may depend on from uh, problem to problem, but the essential point is this is a pure geometrical relation. I haven't used any Einstein equation, anything. It's just a metric. So, so, uh, so, so that's why it, it, it can uh, uh, apply to a very uh, wide range of things. Uh, by the way, yeah, I, there are this uh, a theta variables which is used in a very different way from people to people. So it's, it's, it's sometimes even us once I com get confused. So I now tend not to use it, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, sometimes the, uh, the signs negative and so on and so forth. But anyway, essentially it's the same, same thing. But it blows up also. Sorry? This theta blows up during oscillation of scalarity because you divide by zero. Yeah, 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 no, no. So, if you remember, uh, yes. what, what, what was it, this? Yeah, yeah, this definition, and, and, and you don't have to go into co moving slice if you have some problems. Going to uniform density or uniform Hubble is actually better. Yes. Very good. Right. Yeah. For instance, yeah, yeah, the uniform, yeah, yeah. uniform Hubble slice is well defined. Which slice is well defined? Uniform Hubble. This is, this is essentially, you know, expansion rate is uh, homogeneous in time. It's for you, well ah, space. but for z, it's well defined or not? Sorry? For z variable, it's z. well defined. Zeta variable itself is not well defined in, in this co-moving one, huh? Yeah, I know, I know. But uh, as I said, I mean, in the end, uh, I mean, so it doesn't really matter which coordinate you choose. I mean, because the final result is important. And in that sense, yes, uh, here we are not because this is just given by total derivative, I mean, how you choose the slice in between actually goes away. And, and everything depends only on initial and final. So, so that's, that's why, I mean, you don't encounter any problems. But uh, if you are worried about the evolution of this, then you choose, for example, you have a slice where everything is uni a... Uh, uh, so your quantity has no trouble at Z has trouble. I is not the same as Z. In that sense, yeah. It's not the same. It's approximately the same, but, uh, uh, you know, this is delta N, <laughs> which is more important and more useful. If you agree, please. <laughs> anyway, so... You said that still now you didn't use any... Ah, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So, so now you have to use huh, a... Oh, uh, well, this is... So maybe I should just skip this because I don't have much time. Uh, uh, yeah, well, but maybe I should, yes. Uh, so, so this is the uh, simple a, a, uh, a case of uh, a, a, a single field inflation case, as we have said. In this case, actually, you don't really need the ten formula, but uh, uh, the, you can interpret the final result in terms of the ten, meaning that this a, a fluctuations between some final time to the initial is given by the fluctuation the initial uh, time at the Hubble crossing is, excuse me, be, be, can be regarded like this. Uh, if you consider a coordinate transformation because from uh, flat slicing to the co-moving slicing, then, then you, you have this uh, relation in, in co-moving slice, you have non-trivial uh, coverage of elevation and, and the flat slice you have non-trivial scalar field perturbation, and these two are related, uh, as we know, uh, uh, and in any case, uh, and, and uh, if you do the transformation, delta t, and, and, and to make this flat slicing to co-moving, so that co-moving means that scalar field is homogeneous, you, you find the uh, transformation of the uh, time a variable, and then, and then this final coverage perturbation, which is given by delta n, can be just written in terms of h delta t in the beginning because the coverage of elevation is conserved uh, from now, from this point on. So uh, if you uh, compute the uh, perturbation shear, then that is the end of, that is equal to the uh, final uh,
value. And, and this explains why, I mean, in some sense, that the curvature valuation uh, you want to obtain was given by delta n at initial slice. Yes. And, and, but uh, this condition, this, this argument applies only if the curvature valuation conserved on supervising scale, which is true only in the case of a single scroll inflation. So you have to uh, expand this to a multiple field case. And uh, very fortunately, I don't have enough time to uh, show this. But uh, you could sort of uh, imagine that if you compute delta n again, and with some multiple scale field, but everything's fluctuation is evaluated on this flat slicing at the horizon crossing, this then automatically gives you the quantity you want to compute. So, so this is, the, in some sense, a power of delta n. Yes? You know what to compute, and it's very easy to compute once you know how. Uh, this is uh, some, uh, something which you can forget here now. Uh, yeah, well, this is about just the tensor to scale ratio comments because uh, you know, if you usually you have so called tensor to scale ratio given by this uh, epsilon variable, uh, but uh, if you have more scale field coming to play, then of course more scale field means uh, the uh, denominator becomes large. So actually, this is always a upper bound. Yes. So, uh, so, so, so if you have multiple scale field, this becomes smaller and smaller, unfortunately. But uh, that's the life. Yes. Now, let me just go to nonlinear extension. So, on supervising scales, as I said, I, I you know essentially you 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 have say wavelength is much greater than the Hubble scale. So the spatial derivative is small compared to the time derivative. I mean, you know, you, we are interested in something which vary in time. So uh, essentially time uh, variation is determined at the Hubble parameter. Or maybe uh, from the standard gravitational uh, language, it's the free fall time scale, uh, inverse of free fall time scale. But anyway, so, so in this limit, actually, if you just consider a evolutions for a few number of e-falls, just a few number of efforts, not, not too, too many, then these two causally disconnected regions would never talk to each other. Meaning that there's no a, uh, propagation of uh, information from one to the other. If there's no propagation, then you can solve the equations just uh, locally. Yes? You don't have to worry about the uh, information coming in from the other side. So, so, which means that field equation becomes ordinary differential equation in time. And this always, you, you can see that now equation would ex look exactly like the homogeneous uh, equations for the homogeneous universe, because in homogeneous universe you don't have any special derivatives. Okay, so, so this is the assumption of gradient expansion, spatial gradient expansion. So you just uh, associate some parameter epsilon uh, uh, in front of the spatial derivative. And uh, in the end, you just take epsilon to the zero uh, if you want to obtain the leading order term. If you want to go to the second order, you keep to this epsilon square term. Anyway, and you assume the metric in the standard sort of 3 plus 1 formalism form. This n dt, n is a lapse function. And uh, you have the beta, which is shift vector. And you have some determinant one sort of a spatial metric, uh, which essentially contains gravitational or tensor perturbations, uh, plus some a, a term which represents the volume of free space, and which actually gives rise to this expansion of the universe, and so on and so forth. So this exponential alpha can be, if you assume there are some fiducial background, decomposing into scale factor times exponential psi, something, some function, which is the function of space and time. And, uh, well, you don't have to, but this is a, uh, a convenient, because uh, in any case, you won't have some uh, uh, reference sort of isotropic and space free, uh, freedom and universe. Anyway, so, uh, so and, and then you can choose the value of this at certain point, I mean, uh, uh, to be zero, 
uh, everything is just convention. Anyway, now up to here, if you just write it down, as I said, this is most general. The most important and crucial assumption is this component is of uh, the quantity of order epsilon. And uh, so when the epsilon goes to zero, this disappears. And if you assume this uh, uniformly everywhere, then then you actually you you have this uh, a, a well defined graduate expansion, which uh, in the epsilon zero limit reduces to a, a purely homogeneous uh, universe. And then you can take the small fluctuations on very large scale into account, order by order. Yes. So, so as I said, at leading order, and, and now, previously it was linear theory, but now there's no linear approximation. So this applies on totally fully nonlinear, except that you are taking only the leading order term. Okay. Then, uh, here comes some equation which is important. This is the standard sort of a, 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 um, a conservation, energy conservation equation. And uh, the whole point is that they now, uh, oh, by the way, yes, uh, from this one, or maybe even from the, when I talked about Friedman equation, we, we are, I am, I uh, concentrate focusing on the general relativity. And if, uh, if your theory is different, Instead of this uh, freedom equation, you may, may have some modified freedom equation. But uh, I, I, I think that essentially the uh, structure would be the same. But anyway, uh, here you have this energy conservation equation, which is, and we, as we know, I mean, given the equation state, this and this together with two, these two determines the evolution of the universe completely, right? So, so actually, this means that uh, including this will solve the Einstein equation. So this is where the Einstein equation comes in. Anyway, uh, uh, well, uh, so this is the, some uh, comments. Anyway, now taking a look at the uh, form of the energy momentum tensor, then, then you assume so-called a, a, uh, a, a, a full, a, what do you call it, a, a perfect fluid form which means that the, the, everything is essentially given in terms of density and pressure. And pressure is isotropic. Yes. And uh, you may take some small corrections, uh, but th these small corrections should be of order epsilon square or higher. So, so, so this is at leading order, this should be the case. Otherwise, the equation becomes inconsistent. Now, in this case, the energy conservation is the, uh, this is the exact form of the energy conservation. Uh, and uh, where the expansion actually is given in terms of the uh, this uh, time derivative of this parameter alpha, and uh, this is essentially the uh, Hubble parameter, yes, and and uh, the Hubble parameter here. Now uh, three it comes from three dimensions. Uh, if you are living in four spatial dimension, this becomes four. But anyway, this this is corresponds to the Hubble parameter, local Hubble parameter, expansion rate at each point. Now. Uh, I assume that the uh, beta is over the uh, epsilon, then uh, uh, here again, corresponding to that as assumption, we assume so-called this peculiar velocity or velocity field is over the epsilon. Therefore, it should vanish in the epsilon zero limit. In this limit, you recover a, essentially the, the exact freedom and universe equation, except for time spatial dependence. Yes? So, so so, and, and, and well, actually, this corresponds to if, uh, particularly that the absence of both these modes and so on and so forth, but uh, this is another additional complication. Anyway, then, actually, if you take the expansion of the, uh, this uh, normal vector, normal to hypersurface, then this is difference between this expansion to the actual expansion rate of the matter is identical up to epsilon square. Uh, correction. So again, this means that Hubble rate here can be identified. Uh, this is the most important part in the, in that sense. Oops, can go back. Why? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. So 
Here, I, uh, uh, this well, it depends on which gauge you're taking, but the, uh, you know, this, this is essentially a defined on, uh, from matter point of view. So, uh, so this, this, this will be an expansion of a, uh, sorry, the other way around. This, this, this is defined from matter point of view. And this is a geometrical quantity which is defined with respect to a hypersurface. Now, these two are uh, usually completely different. But in this assumption, these two become identical. That's why you, know, you, you have a, 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 a very important equality. Now, so now once you have noticed this, then you know, the only thing you have to do is uh, sort of uh, compute the number of e-fold, and the number of e-fold can be uh, computed from the conservation equations, because that's the only equation we have now. I mean, uh, that's the uh, equation which governs the homogeneous universe, but now <laughs> this also governs in homogeneous, but in you know, a very long way uh, universe. Now, so, so you just, yeah, in order to uh, 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 integrate, you just write down the uh, alpha dot, you know, and, and in terms of the uh, rho dot over 3 rho plus p, and, uh, which is just uh, this simple equation here. Yes, the energy conservation equation. And, and, and then, 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 then this can be uh, uh, decomposed into the background Hubble plus some fluctuation. You don't have to, but uh, this is how, uh, you know, when you want to compute something fluctuating, then uh, this is the uh, a normal way. But anyway, then uh, this n is the, uh, not number e for it's the uh, lapse function. Huh? <laughs> Sorry of uh, confusion. So, so this n is the number of e for, and this is the lapse function. So, so this is d tau. And uh, as I said, you just compute the number of e for from 1 to 2, and you get this expression. And this is a uh, very general expression. Now, uh, the fluctuations in N is essentially equal to, uh, 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 well, again, I mean, uh, how should I say? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if, you, if you plug this in here, this one here, here, then you see essentially the difference. This can be integrated, totally integrated, and difference of the, this psi function will be the uh, uh, fluctuations in number of e-folds. Yes, and, and so, so this is just given in this form. So, to summarize, if you want, if this is again, we are not defining the gauge yet, but the leading order of the, you know, ignoring the epsilon square correction, which is the so-called separate universe approach, then you can ignore everything and, and uh, essentially you have this relation for any arbitrary gauge. But since from here you just uh, have to define a, which gauge you want to compute. And then it's trivial I mean, to see that now we want to compute something initial to be psi called zero slice, which is the corresponds to flat slicing, and uh, final slice to be co-moving or uniform density or Actually, because this is written in terms of density, uh, it's better to write, better to assume this to be given on uniform density slicing. But anyway, so that's a small sort of a comment. I guess, uh, yeah, whoops, uh, I should, yeah. Uh, so, so this is, again, a uh, very similar picture, is, is, except that the dose fluctuation can be very, quite large. It's the only the uh, wavelengths which must be la large enough. And uh, a, uh, yeah, so now, of course, uh, this psi called zero gauge actually is not really flat. <laughs> now, if you go to highly uh, to nonlinear order, even if this is zero, you have non trivial uh, a, uh, curvature. Yes? So, so curvature, uh, spatial curvature equals zero is not equal to psi equals zero. But uh, because, uh, I mean, uh, if, if you introduce some uh, new terminology, it makes more complicated. So we just call it flat slice, although it's not exactly flat. It's flat in the linear limit. But anyway, 
we, we can choose this cycle zero gauge, okay? So, so which we, we call flat slicing. Yeah, and, and then, then mm. in, in this slicing, of course, uh, as you could easily see, the geometry is closest to the homogeneous as the universe, and the uh, number of fold between one t slice one to slice two is exactly equal to the number of fold of background. Uh, but uh, but uh, again, uh, well, this, this is because of, in some sense, gauge artifact. I mean, uh, you choose the gauge where you, you, you know, the delta n vanishes. So that's another sort of way of choosing a gauge. Yeah. Now, so, so let us uh, uh, take the slicing that the uh, initial slice is flat, as we all read this, and the final slice to be uniform density. And if you can, co-moving, this may not be chosen, but uh, may not exist. But in that case, take uniform density or uniform Hubble. But in the nonlinear formulation, actually uniform density is best because we are dealing with this density uh, formula. But anyway, so, so then, then you can easily uh, straightforwardly see that uh, you know, the difference of the delta n is equal to the uh, fluctuation of the curvature on the final uniform density slice. And, and uh, uh, from that on, of course, you have to show by the using the equation of motion that this uh, curvature perturbation is conserved, but uh, this is fairly trivially seen. So, uh, so you can actually see that uh, even at nonlinear level, and if you choose the slice is a uniform density, then the curvature and the and universe is in the adiabatic limit. Namely, there's no sort of other degrees of freedom. Then, then everything is conserved from this on. So the only, the final amplitude we want to compute is the curvature perturbation here, which is equal to the uh, delta n, uh, which is essentially a, a difference between the flat slicing and the uniform density slicing. But of course, uh, uh, computing this quantity here at the end is uh, a, a sort of a, how say, a, a useless thing because uh, <laughs> if you want to know this, then you have to evolve everything, and then uh, you get back to the standard good old problems. But the whole point is actually you can compute this from the contribution from the initial flat slice. So. Now, now, as I, as I uh, said, that the, uh, any, anyway, the nonlinear curvature perturbation, uh, sorry, the, the delta n formula is simply given by this formula, uh, where you take initial slice to be flat and the final slice to be uniform density. Now, in this case, uh, uh, if you assume, actually, uh, wait a minute, uh, I, I think you need to assume the p is a function of rho. Uh, no, what is this? Uh, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. This is just, just <laughs> want to tell you, I mean, it's sort of a, a maybe tautological. I mean, this delta n, because we chose initial slice to be flat, uh, is independent of uh, time t1. And, and uh, I just tried to write explicitly, but that. Uh, I guess this is unnecessary. This is enough. Mm. Now, in, in, in the case, may, maybe I should finish. Okay, okay, maybe, maybe okay, so, so, so far, okay. Now, the uh, next lecture I start with this uh, conserved quantity, but uh, maybe we should stop here and uh, ask you, uh, you can ask me questions. So, right, so now the session for questions. Do you have any questions? Yeah, maybe I, I, I spoke too fast, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a bit, I mean, it's a fairly simple thing, but uh, if you try to think, then you get confused sometimes. So, uh, I don't know. Just ask any simple questions, please. Then I uh, can slow down. <laughs> Yeah. In your model, do you 
I don't think you are showing small information or anything. Nothing, nothing, no. Yeah. So even if there are some violations of the small condition, it's okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. You can Calculate the power yes. The yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, if you, if you have some uh, some uh, specific features inside the horizon, then this cannot. This this applies to only in any physics outside the horizon. So essentially, multi-field case. And in the, if you have several multi-field and you have some uh, non-trivial dynamics on superhorizon scales, then this is very useful. Another useful case is so-called, these days we, we call ultra slow, slow roll inflation, where actually the scale, scale field is really breaking towards some constant value. Uh, uh, so phi dot behaves like a 1 over a cube. Uh, and in this case, uh, you cannot use the uh, uh, standard sort of a slow roll formula because, uh, as I said in the beginning, the, the curvature perturbation actually is increasing time. It has a constant mode is subdominant, and and so it's a standard computation breaks down. But even in this case, if you uh, apply this data, and you just get the answer straightforwardly, and and you don't have to go into detailed computations. Yeah. So when you consider the primordial black hole yeah. production using yeah. the super slow um, rolling, mm -hmm. maybe your delta n formalism is. Sure, sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Just that's a, just one thing you can think of, of course. Yeah. Any other questions? And let's have some break and let's thank Mr. Okay. Thank you. All right.